Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for uh, this talk, which will consider forms of feminist practice. Uh, my name is Harriet. My pronouns are she, her, and I work on the public program here at the AA with Manager. And this event is part of a series we have called Portraits of Practice, which uh, is taking place alongside the exhibition we have in our gallery, which looks at the life and work of architect MJ Long, um, specifically through a doll's house that she made for her daughter. Um, but the event series sort of takes these themes and topics that are explored in the exhibition as its starting point to discuss the gendering of spaces and objects in architecture and the built environment um, and related disciplines and to think about how we could make these more equitable. So we're really delighted to be joined by such a fantastic panel of speakers tonight. Um, they're practitioners who work independently and collectively to uh, question gender roles, choreographies of labor, uh, the design of spaces of care, um, and how we can employ forms of feminist practice in an inclusive way. Um, so with them tonight, we will discuss what feminist practice is, how it can open up a multitude of ways of working, um, and we'll consider how it can be a way of operating that people across the gender spectrum can embrace. And yeah, so I guess to briefly introduce our amazing panel of speakers, um, I'll go in the al alphabetical order, but also the order that they'll be presenting in. So um, first of all, uh, Rayan Al Nayal is a co-founder and director of Space Black. Um, and they describe themselves as a team of black women who are architectural designers and engineers building a practice that resists the traditional model um, that excluded them. Um, and tonight, Ran will speak about their work recentering voices that are often marginalized through projects such as the House of Youth at the Design Museum. So excited to hear more. Um, Ran will be followed by Mariana Janowicz and uh, Alice Maya. Uh, who are two of the six editors um, of EDIT, a feminist design collective. Uh, EDIT's work focuses on the enduring biases and hierarchies embedded into the environments that surround us, and they use design as a tool to support more equal interactions. Um, and tonight they're going to share a range of their projects that address and critique forms of domestic labor. Um, then followed by George Masood. Uh, architect, educator, and cultural worker, and my, my former colleague. <laughs> and, um, and I guess, like, yeah, a lot of George's work builds futures and solidarity with the various ecologies that shape our built environment. And uh, this underlying philosophy uh, is explored in the spaces that George occupies, and hopefully we'll hear more about tonight, um, both in terms of your practice at Material Cultures and also through a POA, a platform and support network. And then last but not least, Sarah Wicklesworth, um, director of her own practice here, uh, based here in London, which operates across theory, research, writing, and building. And tonight, Sarah's going to present her stock orchard street dining table sequence drawings, which everybody probably already knows. But um, in this summer, Harriet and I went to the zone and saw them framed together along with the plan of a house. And um, seeing that in that context also made us think very differently about how much has changed since that those drawings were made, but also how little. Um, and so uh, she'll speak a bit about the choreography of women's different roles across domestic spaces and discuss how these observations have shaped her architectural career at the intersection of feminist and sustainable practices. So um, we'll now hand over to each of the participants to kind of each briefly talk about their form of practice and then um, have a discussion to follow that we will open up to all of you to join in, we hope. So over to you. Thank you. Yeah, so um, thank you. Um, we're Space Black. So Space Black is uh, made up of myself and Heba Tabidi. I think she's here somewhere. Um, and yes, it's a creative studio of black built environment professionals. So my background is in architecture. I also teach architecture. Um, and I practice as an artist, um, and Hibbert is a civil engineer. Um, so, yeah, me, I'm an educator and architectural designer. I teach at the University of Greenwich, um, and I co-founded Space Back with the desire to share a vision that embraces alternative um, uh, inclusive design approaches, and that was after a few years in traditional practice where I had a really hard time um, being treated the way I was in practice, um, and in traditional education, 
And I knew it wasn't for me, I think, from the first year, like from part one. Um, continued to part two for a couple years. And then, um, yeah, I, I realized it wasn't for me. Um, but I loved architecture and I loved, loved studying architecture. So I wanted to kind of continue speculating. Um, and I now do that through uh, my artwork. Um, so I'm an artist as well. Um, I'm also Sudanese. So I never saw any kind of Sudanese representation anywhere in architecture in the UK. So I was very interested in speculating on architectural spaces that are futuristic, but were more inclusive of Sudanese women that look like me. Um, so this is kind of like my works now. These are just, some of them are commissioned works. Some of them are, um, yeah, personal work that I create when I have time, which is not, not uh, very often. Um, this is Hiba. Um, Hiba is uh, also Sudanese and she's a civil engineer and DJ. Um, so what's really nice actually is that we're both kind of built environment practitioners, but we have like this creative practice that's a little bit divorced from um, our everyday work at Space Black. For me, that's artwork um, and exhibiting and, and creating kind of a really fun experimented of work and for him it's DJing and we look after those practices we think it's really important for us to be able to maintain what we do um, so what do we do um, we have three main ventures um, and they can kind of be categorized between uh, the three which is education research and design and culture so for us education is really important because we uh, we think design is very inaccessible especially in the UK and especially um, considering how uh, terrible traditional or the British curriculum is um, in neglecting art and design so a lot of programs like the the ones we many J men at um, the design museum which is working with young people who want to become designers um, but I don't have access. Research and design, this is where we might consult on designs. We might work on very small scale projects, um, but we're not that interested in kind of contributing to very large uh, building projects, to be honest. Um, and then culture is where we hold, hold um, spaces uh, where we just ha you know, have music, have discussions, um, have exhibitions, really informal formats to actually talk about architecture, talk about design. A lot of the times people attend, have a really good time, and then they'll tell us that, you know, they didn't think that, they didn't never thought about space or their cities in that way. Um, so that's kind of like what we really like doing with um, culture. So this is the young people from the Design Museum um, where we co-design and co-built with them. So for us, this is very much kind of like the scale of architectural projects that we like delivering, um, uh, where we don't necessarily control the design, but we just um, empower the young people with skills, skills and facilities. So spaces like the Design Museum, where there's a workshop, there's materials, you know, there's these excellent spaces they can work in. We go in there and um, kind of uh, deliver these workshops and build with them. Um, this was recently at the Mosaic Rooms, and this was uh, a project that Resolve had uh, called in uh, called Tools of Solidarity, um, where we often spoke about solidarity with Palestinian people, so we're Sudanese, solidarity with Sudanese as well. So this is a young Sudanese child who actually um, fled the war recently, and um, this was providing a space where they can play, a space where... Um, they can kind of express themselves and, and it, it really makes a difference. And so we go in there and help them design their own dollhouses. So this was a Barbie inspired dollhouse. Um, and then Red Path is uh, the kind of projects that we work on. So this is a path that's been heavily neglected in Hackney um, and a lot of young people use it. And we're, right now we're in the process of having workshops with young people and helping them design. Um, they're proposed for this path, which potentially will go to stage two and beyond. Um, so yeah, that's, I hope I didn't uh, overrun. No, that's great. <laughs> no, yeah. Thank you. So Mariana and I are from Edit. We are, <laughs> we are a feminist design uh, collective. We call ourselves feminist design collective because of the way we, um, practice um, and um, we are formed by uh, six members um, and we are a mix of architects, um, 
project managers, um, but also set designers and uh, teachers. And um, we uh, work in various uh, fields that you can maybe talk about. Should I give a shout out to everyone um, who's not here? So um, apart from Alicia and I, there's Alberta Lauritsen, Sajel Tank, Hannah Rosenberg, and Sophie Williams. Um, and we've been working together for a few years now on um, design and research projects. Um, so um, we've done kind of, um, yeah, speculative research work. Um, we've designed a few exhibitions um, and recently uh, we've been working on some public spaces and one of our latest projects uh, was a social space for young people in Somerstown. Um, we uh, worked with DSDHA um, architects, um, and it was a it was a co-design um, project. So we hope that it will be built soon. But yeah, starting from the beginning, <laughs> this was our first research project, which has inspired a lot of other small projects. Um, and it's continuing kind of to inspire our research uh, and it's called Honey I'm Home. Um, so just to summarize the core of the project, uh, we um, started looking at domestic space as um, basically a series of um, theatrical sets um, that in our opinion are designed under a system of patriarchy and are very rarely interrogated. Um, so starting from this critique of our homes and the state in which they are at the moment, um, our first physical project was more of a um, provocation, let's say, and uh, we, we basically answered to an open call from the Oslo Architecture uh, Triennale in 2019. Um, and we contributed with this piece called Gross Domestic Product, um, which um, basically um, commented on uh, the division of domestic labor in the house. Uh, and it was basically trying to uh, take a very recognizable object, so one of the props of this um, theatrical sets, uh, and uh, iterate it, uh, change it, and tweak it um, by uh, basically changing uh, the meaning of it in the space. So we, basically the Hoover um, can only be operated by three people simultaneously. And that basically makes sure that, you know, domestic labor and cleaning the house, it's an act that can only be done together and collectively. Um, and it wasn't meant to be a propositional, let's say, serious uh, design work, but it was meant to uh, make people in the exhibition first use it together, <laughs> which happened, uh, but also make people think about an alternative trajectory in which um, domestic labor is not an individual act, but is shared. And um, it was set in basically this fictional narrative um, where basically this Uber was designed in, 20, in uh, 1919, so the time where the first Uber was born but it was basically the discarded kind of design and proposal. So, and we took this kind of um, technique, which is more related to artists that set basically an object into a fictional narrative um, to basically make people in exhibition embed themselves into a story. Um, and um, right now the Uber has traveled all around Europe since <laughs> since uh, it was built, so it has gone to uh, several um, Biennale and exhibitions uh, in France, in Germany, in uh, Sweden, I think, as well. Um, so, um, yeah, and it's still abroad. <laughs> um, and, yeah. Um, and this is another project that um, is also about domestic labor, and it takes some lessons from uh, the GDP or the gross domestic product. Um, we've also became interested in the work of laundry um, and we noticed how um, widespread 
the washing line bans are. So in London and in other cities in the global north, uh, drying laundry outside is often forbidden by lease covenants, landlords or management organizations to kind of preserve the appearance of buildings. Um, at the same time, in Britain, we've got huge issues with damp and mold. Um, and there are these uh, documents called condensation guides that are distributed to tenants and they instruct them to produce less moisture. Um, so that includes no, uh, instructing them not to dry laundry indoors. Um, so we, we became interested in this paradox of like, where should we actually dry our laundry? Um, and this has um, led to me taking up a design research residency at the Design Museum uh, 2022 23 um, where I looked at laundry a bit further. Um, and then I invited Edit to co-create the final installation uh, with me. So this is uh, damp or drying and moisture performance. Um, and it uses um, this method that we've been developing at EDIT of using recognizable domestic appliances, but kind of hacking and tweaking them. Um, so in DAMP, um, you can see a dehumidifier suspended from the ceiling above, um, and it extracts moisture from the gallery room, and it trickles it back onto the T-shirt, and the T-shirt proclaims, I am moisture which is a reference to the condensation guides, which say produce less moisture. Um, but of course, we are moist beings, so it is very difficult. Um, <coughs> and here is um, here is a close up. Um, but yeah, that's that's us and our two projects. Very briefly, thank you. Uh, I'm George, um, and actually Manija and Harriet asked me to talk about um, uh, two projects today, uh, POA, which is uh, a community organization, and Material Cultures, which is um, what I spend most of my time doing now. And I thought what I'll do is I'll maybe introduce POA and also talk about how it has informed my practice today. Um, so POA is a project that um, started when I was working in a, in a large, for, for a large practice um, and really kind of disillusioned by the profession or the discipline, let's say. Um, so uh, really I, the way the kind of the office was organized and um, the, the process of design and also our relationship to um, to construction. So, uh, so POA kind of emerged during that period of my life, uh, which was maybe about, uh, I don't know, seven years ago now. And it's, it's a, it's a social, uh, support network, um, for LGBTQI plus, uh, SWANA migrants that are navigating their identities. Um, and really coming to terms with what it means to kind of exist as diasporic people. Um, it's really a, a space uh, for engaging with politics of care and uh, resource sharing and, and knowledge production. Um, and, and the way that it does that is by holding and building its, its own spaces for its own community. Uh, so there, there are many dimensions to the project, but today maybe I will focus a little bit on, um, on, on the kind of community organizing aspect of it um, and how essentially what it tries to do or what it engages with is to, to create a, a kind of a, to try and reimagine a, a, an, ecology of, uh, an ecology of care, which is still relational, but doesn't uh, necessarily um, have these kind of power dynamics. Um, so what we what we what we try to do is to or what we've been trying to do is to really think about how we can uh, how we can reimagine our own spaces, but also our own economies and our own systems. Uh, so if you can imagine queer families outside 
of, uh, of state recognition, uh, alternative systems of community accountability, self-governance, um, and also how we can navigate really complex emotional uh, territories uh, together without really relying on or trying to escape, let's say, uh, uh, this kind of patriarchal, misogynistic uh, terms and values and, um, and language. Um, so really the, the whole project is, uh, is in a constant state of becoming and it's, uh, it's always trying to kind of unlearn the manifestations of the system, the systems that we're trying to escape. Um, and and it's, it, what, it, what, it, what it tries to do is to build this kind of infrastructure. Um, uh, and uh, in order to be able to operate as a, as a collective. And so I, I don't really have much time, let's say, in my presentation to, uh, to describe these, uh, these spaces, but maybe, maybe in the discussion we can do that. Um, but maybe one last thing before I, uh, I transition to uh, <laughs> material cultures is, I think uh, it's really creative work as opposed to reactive work. So it's not campaign work, but it's really, there is a creative element to organizing that's really fundamental to that project. Um, I don't spend much time uh, doing community organizing anymore, um, but that is still very much my community and is still very much uh, what informs uh, how I exist um, and how I relate to other people. So this kind of, uh, this, this politics of care in, uh, in a queer collective was really kind of crucial for me in how uh, I practice as a spatial practitioner um, and as an architect. Uh, so maybe I'll describe a bit material cultures for those of you who uh, are not familiar with, uh, with the practice. We're a design and research organization, uh, and we uh, advocate for the use of bio-based materials in construction. So those are materials that are uh, cultivated in woods and fields and wetlands. And really, the, uh, our work sits at the intersection of uh, natural materials, uh, construction uh, technology, and uh, low embodied uh, carbon construction. Um, the, work, the work that we do isn't really about what's happening now or what happens in a few years, but it's about the landscape legacies that we are, uh, we are leaving for the generations after next. And so the way, what, how we understand the act of building is, or the act of building is, uh, we understand it as landscape making or, or terraforming. Um, and so how we understand our impact on, uh, on the land and landscapes is really fundamentally tied to uh, um, our, our knowledge of how we extract, process, um, and use these materials. And so what we, what we are doing is trying to find new narratives, uh, ways of organizing, and methods of uh, production um, to really try and combat these short-term extractive practices um, in favor of long-term environmental and social gain. Um, and this work really begins with the landscape itself and with our relationship to the land by asking it what it needs rather than by telling it what we want. Um, and so there is a kind of, uh, there is an element of care and uh, custodial responsibility that really speaks to uh, to the landscapes and to the land and to our buildings, but also to each other. And so all of these things are really interconnected. Um, so I'm maybe talk a little bit about, very quickly, uh, how that kind of applies in design in the office and on the construction site. Um, 
And so in, in design, we really tried to move away from complicated building systems um, and, uh, and really root our work in uh, collective knowledge um, and a deep understanding uh, of, uh, of the land. In the office, it's really about how we define our values and how we apply that in practice and really in, or in everyday practice and really acknowledge that how that's connected to a much kind of larger uh, socio-political set of uh, systems. And so um, we've been, and, and I think this talk has been really timely in a way because we've been doing a lot of self-reflection in, uh, in the office the last few months, um, running uh, or facilitating these workplace uh, workshops um, where we are really looking at how we define our values and how we apply them uh, across different projects, but more importantly, in, in our practice um, and how we, are, how we are organized, how we operate, um, and, and really how we build these infrastructures to support each other um, in ways that don't perpetuate the same oppressive uh, systems that we are trying to escape. And so, like, very simply speaking, that's kind of looking at working hours and uh, uh, pay transparency frameworks, um, uh, uh, recruitment policies, uh, feedback, reflection, conflict resolution, um, uh, responsibilities, decision making, ownership. Um, so everything that kind of sits within the ecosystem of uh, of working in a, in a practice with a group of people. Uh, on the construction side, I think uh, this is something that we've started working on this year is we're really kind of interested in the role of the worker or the, the let's say the productive body um, on site and how it's very much been reduced to very specific functions in a kind of production line. Um, and and these, this, very much links to an industrialized construction industry um, that hasn't really been good for the people that work in it. And so how we respect labor and the body is very intrinsically tied to uh, the use of less toxic materials. Um, so we run these workshops uh, that look at how, uh, how we use bio-based materials in construction, um, and really they're an opportunity to bring people together from many different disciplines that, uh, uh, whose work is really about, uh, or who, who, who really center the land as their main protagonist, um, and to learn from each other, uh, through that process. So it's participatory and it's reciprocal. There is of course a facilitator or very often two facilitators that come with, um, with some kind of specialist knowledge, but then there is a, uh, it's usually over two or three days and there is a, an exchange that's uh, really kind of fruitful. So I think there is a really interesting thing there. There is re something really interesting in that space uh, because they take place also on live construction sites to really think about where the role of the architect and the, and the kind of the maker or the fabricator, how, how those two spaces can kind of overlap and we've been looking a lot at like where the design process, how, how we can uh, integrate the de design process in the process of making. Um, so I think maybe I'll stop there. And yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna do something slightly different, which is I'm gonna talk about, um, how I think about being a female architect and a feminist in a very different world. And I'm gonna do it through talking about this project, Stock Orchard Street. Um, I mean, in a way, this is a, a sort of millstone project which has followed us around for 25 years and I'm still talking about it, but you know, <laughs> forgive me for that. But um, in a way, it's also interesting because it's a foundational project and it's very unique because in many ways, it's sort of autobiographical project. Um, where are we? 
So I'm going to talk about it under six categories, um, all of which sort of spin out ideas around uh, feminism and architecture. And they are these categories, which I won't read to you because I know um, you can do it for yourselves. But I think um, if, we, if we start with the everyday, um, one of the things that we felt very strongly about, or I particularly felt very strongly about when, I, uh, when we came to design this building, was that, you know, typically under, in, under sort of the patriarchal ways of thinking about architecture, the gold standard has always been the sort of public building, the high profile, the well-funded, uh, the thing connected with high finance and, you know, with a status symbol building. And actually, in my opinion, these are the spaces which tend to be occupied by men. And we were looking for an idea about uh, what are the spaces that are, you know, classically thought of as women's spaces, and they are the forgotten places of the everyday. Um, that you know, they're the schools, the nurseries, the domestic sphere, these kinds of places. Um, even the buses, you know, there's a sort of hierarchy in the transport system, how you move around the city and so on and so on. So we were looking for a, a kind of hook for an idea about how we could embed this idea about a uh, modest, humble space, if you like, as an antidote to the idea of patriarchal space. And at that time, I was working in, an, in the attic of a four-storey house, which we'd bought and done up. And the dining table on the ground floor became this place where all the uh, letters and samples and meetings would happen. But it was also the place where we ate and did everything around, uh, you know, around that domestic sphere. So the dining table became this kind of icon for this confusion of the everyday world of your domestic scene with being an architect. And that was my life, you know, that is my life. And I thought that's actually really interesting. And when we came to design Stock Orchard Street, um, this sequence of drawings became a real sort of uh, manifesto for this idea of the confusion of living and working in the same space and how you identify as householder, uh, architect, you know, feminist, whatever, within this space. And, and I mean, the Dining Table series, I must be clear, is a post-rationalization of the set of ideas that led to the building, and uh, they're very deliberately so. But I mean, I think what they contain is an idea about another way of thinking about representing architecture and how that can bring about a new thinking about space. So in my opinion, this idea of the kind of blank white sheet with, with uh, solid black lines on it is the, the, the conventional orthographic medium for architecture. It's static, it assumes what the ritual is, it wants to control it, it looks very orderly, but you know, in real life, this is what it's like. It's uncontrolled and the architect cannot be the author of the events that actually take place in there as much as we like to delude ourselves that that is the case. And actually the whole point about the project and the, its connection with the everyday is that you have to enjoy these moments of unpredictability and uh, joy and pleasure, the fights, you know, whatever, the accidents and so forth, and embed them in your architecture because otherwise you're going to end up um, bitter and disappointed and not accept the reality and you know and so the kind of mess at the end of the meal is uh, was the, the sort of way in which we translated that into the plan of the building and, and it's partly because this world is so difficult to represent as an orthographic representation it's no wonder we don't do it um, so we were sort of interested in this life, you know, what is going on in there and the unpredictability. You know, it has to accept the, the thrills and spills of everyday life. And that became the plan for the building. So, um, so that was sort of what's behind the everyday. And this is the living room, you know, big open space that can kind of accept all these different things that go on in it and in an, a kind of fairly uncontrolled way. Okay. Um, the next bit uh, sort of gets to the autobiographical bit, I guess, because it's to do with, you know, exploring my role as householder, but also architect. And sort of, you know, where is the sort of dividing line between my role as the leader of practice and, and an architect and, and being the house, uh, 
the householder and the, the domestic, if you like. Um, and so we were interested in, you know, what are the spatial and material tactics we could use to begin to sort of describe that. And what we decided to do was do a very, very simple sort of binary swap. Um, I mean, I know, I completely accept that we understand gender as a different thing now, but at this point, I was really interested in a, in a very simple message of how do you swap these identities and therefore ask questions about what our expectations are when we meet uh, you know, one or other of these identities. And so essentially the house adopts the spatial tactic of the bureau landshaft and the office adopts the spatial tactic of the terraced house as a sort of lateral conversion, which is what you see on the far right. Um, and, and, the, and the house is actually larger than the office for that very reason. So it's completely counterintuitive as a, as a way of kind of operating. Um, and that's embedded in the plan of the building, as you see, with the leg, vertical leg being the office and the other leg being the house. So this kind of really open space of departments of your daily life uh, distributed across the quote tabletop and then the bit in between which is the sort of lozenge shape is the sort of uh, is the is a dual purpose thing which um, is the kind of mediator between the world of office and the world of uh, the domestic and it plays both roles uh, can be simultaneously if we have an office lunch in there but typically it's our a conference room during the day and then when the sliding wall goes away it's part of the house and becomes a dining dining room as part of that and actually it's in the house and when people come in they are encountering uh, domestic objects uh, paintings pictures sculptures and all that and you can see them do a double take where they don't understand what role they're expected to play in this space so it has this double function of being both you know, a, a formal and official sort of part of the office, but also part of the domestic. And, you know, it's a sort of deliberate, uh, I guess, tactic to get you to question the roles that you play. So the third one is about expertise and uh, amateurship. And one of the things that I encountered as a, an, a young architect was always being told that, um, somebody who had done it for longer knew much better than me how to do it. And I found that very, very irritating, this idea of the kind of law of the father that gets handed down and, and, and you're apprenticed to that idea. And that's reinforced by the way in which, you know, our regulatory system forces you down certain routes to use different uh, certain kinds of materials, put them together in a certain way, you know, follow the rules, be a good girl. And, you know, the same is reinforced through warranties and performance and stuff like that. And actually, one of the things that we were really interested in doing is kind of unpacking a different way of learning how to build through self-build and through using very simple materials. And um, in a sense, um, undermining this idea of the hand down knowledge that comes through patriarchy. Um, and that led to our foray into straw, which was this uh, byproduct of farming, very, uh, you know, big blocks, very simple, dry construction. And we invented all of these techniques by reading books um, that were just becoming available in the UK at the time. I mean, there was no, hardly any buildings built in straw in the UK at the time, so we were inventing it all as we go. And actually what was great about the books that we were reading was that they were not, this is how you do it. They were like, oh, X did this, Y did that, this seemed to work, that didn't work, these were the problems. And so we were kind of making it up as we go along and it was incredibly liberating. Um, same with the sandbags, um, where we invented this technique of using lots of mass on the outside of the building um, so that it makes this kind of bunker wall, which is all intended to keep the noise of trains down because we're right up against the mainline railway to Scotland. Um, and, you know, it's just kind of a fun self-build, do-it-yourself technique, which we could master very, very easily with our builders and, and put it together. And then, of course, there were the, the Gabian walls, which, 
you know, were filled with really rough concrete that came from scrapyards in Stratford before the Olympic Park was built. And again, you know, just trying to think of, well, what would be a really interesting high cholesterol architecture, really fat architecture, which we could build our building out of. Um, so, which brings me to aesthetics, of course, because when this building hit the press, it was like, my God, what is that ugly thing? We don't understand it. Why have you used all these mix of materials? You know, what is the ordering principle? La, la, la. And, um, you know, we were accused of having too many ideas, of mixing the metaphors up. Uh, it was too tactile and sensory, you know, what was this? You know, and, and you've got to bear in mind this is an era where kind of thinness, transparency, and all of these tropes of mastery, if you like, were really, really big and never, never questioned. So, you know, we were combining high tech and, and craft. Um, it was lumpy. You know, I mean, there were, there were all these things that it kind of poked fun at in a way. Um, um, so where are we? Yeah, so here we go. Um, the, the front uh, fence, which is, you know, combines uh, steelwork and wattle. You've got the cloth cladding of the office, which has adopted a kind of soft domestic uh, appearance to something which is actually a workplace. Um, you can see the sandbags on the right. You can see the tower, place of dreams in the, the house. Um, here's an, a view of us um, doing an open day. And, you know, the, the problems we had in trying to get this through the regulatory system were quite myriad, so that when we got our uh, comment from building control and we were saying we wanted to build it in straw, you know, they were going, uh, you know, this could be a problem. <laughs> How are we going to do it? <laughs> so, you know, once you decide to take on the powers that be, you do meet these problems. And, in fact, even, you know, the setting out of the building, we didn't even know where could we get these straw bales? How big are they? You know, how do they perform? So this is me measuring one up so we could actually set the building out in the drawings and work out how big it was going to be. Um, and then uh, the cloth cladding, you know, we made up from scratch as well. You know, we were told by all the tensile structured structures, uh, fabricators that this wasn't going to be possible. We couldn't possibly do something like this. Our builders hated it. They called it the nappy. You know, it went, it went on and on. It was just hilarious. But we did it. <laughs> um, and, of course, I mean, at work behind it is also, you know, the fact that it is a soft, uh, very crafted, very what you might call homemade building. And there is a, a very strong logic behind it, actually, which is to do with the choice of materials. And we did it in the very, very early days of sustainability by, by deciding that the materials we wanted to use, which should either be, have very, very low embodied carbon, should be recycled themselves, like the straw and the gabby and fill, or recyclable. And the only thing that actually isn't particularly is the windows, which are the big, you know, the big high tech element in our building. So the productive landscape is also really important, you know, for keeping your uh, food miles down. It's a, a kind of de-stressing place as well. And I mean, there is this obvious connection of women and Mother Earth, which I don't really want to go into here, but it's very um, essentialist and a bit, in my opinion, a bit contentious. But we can talk about that if you want to. There are lots of eco measures behind it, but they're all quite conventional. And I think the most interesting thing for me is, you know, where these uh, products come from, how they're combined together, and that they are they they do touch the ground lightly. And then finally, there's this idea of the sort of beauty myth. And as I said, you know, it was, you know, th this this got on Robert Elm's show with. Um, uh, former president of the R RIBA talking about architecture and they went to visit it when I was away one day without asking and uh, Robert Elm says why would you want to build a building which has got your granny's knickers on the outside you know more or less like that and you know I think that was generally the kind of reception of the building so we thought well we'll just you know do it anyway and grow old gracefully and in fact that idea was 
built in deliberately because when we designed these bags um, on the railway front, um, they started off totally intact like this and, they, and, the, and the, the, the uh, infill goes hard. But as they ultraviolet, the ultraviolet light hits these things, it, de it, it decays. And so it begins to fray. You get a lot of dandruff all over the place. And finally, it is destroyed altogether. And that's what it's like today. So the idea of time passing through the building and you know, uh, you're being able to accept it gracefully, I think is really important at the heart of the project. Thank you. Thank you all so much for these, I guess, really incredible and very connected presentations. Um, and yeah, I think there's so much to, to think about in what everyone's presented. I'm gonna try and multitask and make the full screen. Um, Just press the green button. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, especially, I guess when in the introduction, Harriet was talking about like how we wanted to do this series to really build on themes in the, the show next door, which if you haven't seen, I hope you get the chance to see later. But um, so much of it was a, um, is about like exploring the blurring of life and work for MJ Long, which I think so, like a lot of you picked up, like this, the d domestic space, the act of care, the, the, the fact that a lot of practitioners have to almost blur the boundaries between so many aspects of their life and resist some of the labels that get put upon them. And I think in what we wanted to do in the discussion is really think about what it means to, to, to talk about feminist practice and, and how how to define that, but also I think Sarah and you were saying that to resist this like handing down of, of knowledge or that or that comes with patriarchy, that actually sometimes like keeping it more open and plural is part of what makes it so exciting that there are communities or as you said, George, ecologies that form, but um, that there's not necessarily a, a right way of doing it, that there's like a, a nice way to like, we you can always reinvent how we work. And I also thought a lot of you talked about the act of care, whether it's um, through kind of organizing workshops, through thinking about how spaces are cared for, um, through caring for each other. And I think the, this idea of being able to do multiple things at once and or to hold multiple things to be true and also to care at the same time um, make me very hopeful for the future of architectural practice. Um, and, and that those kinds of values can be at the core of how we produce things rather than the iconic building or the singular, the myth of the singular author. Um, and, and yeah, I guess I just, I guess to start with, maybe if each of you could, could think about what feminist practice has meant to you and, and where it can be more expansive and where it maybe currently is a bit limiting and what could still change. A huge question. <laughs> yeah, maybe we need uh, half an hour. <laughs> um, we have half an hour. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I can talk a bit about how we do things that I did, and how we would like to do them. Maybe um, <coughs> the way we structure is very non-hierarchical, and that for us is basically a a way to counteract maybe the practices that we are used to, where he drives the productivity of a company. And uh, we found that, that sometimes it is longer, it is more strenuous, it is a lot of voting, but um, it kind of makes our practice a bit more balanced and, uh, and when every voice is kind of heard. Um, now, uh, uh, you know, I think that the feminist approach to design, uh, it's, it's uh, needs to be in how we collaborate with a design team and how we collaborate with the people we're designing for. So, for example, designing, co-designing and those kind of processes are kind of key for, a, in my opinion, at least, to a feminist approach to design. Um, uh, but also, uh, I think, without equality, uh, not only on, like, I don't know, it depends how we understand feminism, which for us is a very much intersectional thing, so unless not only gender, but all of uh, other topics like sexuality and um, class and 
um, many other things come into play, then you know you cannot really call like you cannot really say your practices uh, practicing in a feminist way. So it's for us, it's really looking for collaborations with other practitioners that you know might not be uh, like our identity, which is also very varied between us. Um, so it's about finding also other people to uh, link with and understanding that we are we're a set of um, people that want to get to the same aim and we have to work together to make it work. So that's how I think about it in the way. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, anyone else? Um, maybe I'll just add to this very briefly. Um, We've, I've been um, kind of like coming against this idea of um, when we say we're a feminist design practice or a feminist architectural collective, when people imagine that we're interested in architecture for women somehow. Um, and that's not how I see it. Um, and I think for me being a feminist practitioner or you know, being a part of a feminist design collective. It simply means that I acknowledge this kind of part of life that is inevitably in the work and that we kind of start uh, from this place of acknowledging our own lens and our own kind of set of identities um, and if you are just a normal architectural practice, it doesn't mean that you don't have a lens or an identity or a body that you perceive things through. Um, so, you know, it's just one of the uh, ways through which you can be honest about, you know, being a, being a full person in life and in work. Um, I feel a bit of an outlier here because, I mean, I, I run a practice, but I'm the sole principal, if you like, and I struggle all the time um, trying to have what I call a flat hierarchy where I see my colleagues as, um, you know, my collaborators, but actually they look to me to be the leader um, as if I know what I'm doing, you know, I mean, I think, uh, I think, you know, in a way that's the joy to accept that you don't know what you're doing and you're making it. Now, that is what practice is, you know, we're practicing, we never get there because you're always learning because every situation is completely different. And for me, fem <coughs> feminism is a uh, state of mind, you know, it's an, an attitude and an approach to life. Um, but it's not always shared by people. And I think you have to expect that. And uh, find ways of working around it. Um, and I think that's true of what's projected onto you as well. So, you know, our practice works typically in the mainstream and public, you know, public projects. And the expectation is, is there is a leader, you know, there is a hierarchy. We want to see your uh, organogram, you know, that has lines of responsibility and all these conventional ways of thinking, which I don't necessarily subscribe to. That's a sort of parallel universe that one has to engage with, and it makes feminist practice in the mainstream very, very difficult to do, I think. Um, so it does raise issues around hierarchy and leadership and so forth. Um, but I think, you know, at the same time, th those are the sort of negative things that I experience on a day-to-day -day level. Positively, I mean, I think the conversations are at least out in the open now, which they weren't really when I was a young architect. And that's really good. So it's uh, there's lots of roots into it um, and ways of practicing. And even, you know, gender mainstreaming is coming into planning, coming into architectural discourse and so forth, which is very good because it does raise the agenda um, at an official level. It can be understood in all sorts of ways. But I think the things that are moving against that in the UK at the moment is the battening down in legislation, which we're all up against with the Building Safety Act and all of these things, which are making it more and more difficult to play, actually, and to be inventive with new materials and new ways of doing. And that's really depressing at the moment, I think. And I think that's uh, quite a dangerous 
moment to be a feminist architect. <laughs> Friends, did you want to add? Yeah, um, I think um, what just from what everyone's saying, um, I think feminist practice um, is the conversation has come far too late. I think in architecture, it's arrived very late, um, and so now it does feel like there's a lot of unlearning to do. So feminist practice is unlearning. Feminist practice is constantly um, allowing yourself, giving yourself permission to play um, and reimagine, especially when, you know, you look back at what maybe you were taught in academia and you realise a lot of the men you were taught were, were the um, pioneers, you know, actually had very problematic practices that you would not adopt today. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be, yeah. you wouldn't want to be in the same room as some of these people. Um, and so there's a lot of unlearning to do and, and actually you discover there is no mode that you can adopt um, in terms of practice, just like structure, business-wise. Um, uh, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's allowing yourself permission, giving yourself permission to play um, and maybe even start putting some of those criticisms out. Um, especially because I think university still struggles from that. Academia still really, really struggles with that. Um, and so a lot of what we're doing today may only be kind of taught or implemented in, in much safer ways in 10 or 20 years. Um, and so uh, for us, that's constantly, um, yeah, giving ourselves permission to play, but also not judging ourselves for not. It's very difficult when you're practicing non-traditionally and you leave traditional practice at a young age um, and there's this constant looming um, you know bit of a kind of thinking that's okay if I stayed in practice I would have been uh, earning more or I would have been able to achieve so and so and so outside of architecture and that is um, yeah it's it's very difficult I think you have to kind of surround yourself by other kind of alternative practitioners and people who do um, practice in that way so um, yeah I think it's many different things but it's no there's no there's no model um, and so as an educator I also feel like it's the reassurance telling students that actually now more than ever there are opportunities to pave your own way um, and actually I don't believe that <laughs> all students should go into traditional practice um, I think right now we're already seeing the ARB kind of reforming what the architectural um, architecture practice should look like um, or how people should um, obtain their license in architecture. Um, and so uh, I think there's something exciting happening, but also it's very scary because we it feels like we've arrived at this conversation after probably some industries have made progress and we haven't. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> everything that's been said really resonates. Um, I think for me, it's it's also very much about you know power structures and really trying to kind of uh, to reimagine another way of organizing life. It's it's very much a world building project, and I, I find it actually um, it for me it intersects a lot with like a um, um, a queer politics, which is about you know re rejecting the status quo and like always. Uh, being in that kind of space of um, that uncomfortable space, that space of un of the unknown, and really anchoring in that, and I have found that I really struggled for a long time to get to that space where um, I was able to anchor in my vulnerability and um, and see the strength in that, and I feel um, I feel like it's it's very much a constant journey. Um, uh, and and I find that really liberating. Um, uh, and actually, what I also find quite difficult in practice is, you know, we we are relatively young or new practice, um, and we have many different uh, kinds of clients, and it's very difficult sometimes because you speak about uh, doing things in a particular way, but you don't. Um, uh, you're a bit disillusioned. Actually, your naivety <laughs> is not in your favor. 
especially when you're working with uh, with local authorities. Um, but I find it also quite uh, exciting to test a lot of things out in different spaces. And also, I think it's he helped us be a bit more specific about where we want to, um, where we want our practice to, you know, to where we want to focus our energies. Um, and yeah. Thanks. I was wanting to pick up a bit more on what you were saying, Ryan, about unlearning, because I think you all touched on it in your presentations in different ways. And I also, so there's a lot of unlearning to do, obviously. But I thought it was also quite funny, Sarah, you said, you don't know what you're doing, but I'm sure you do. But then with the unlearning, there must also come a lot of learning when you set up as a feminist practice or you try and work in these different ways. So I was wondering if you could each go into a bit more detail about things that you have unlearned, but also how you have come to learn new forms of working and maybe maybe sometimes that was in education but probably it was through trial and error or um yeah just if you could share a bit more about that yeah I mean I think um with unlearning I think having kind of gone through the process of being in education um and then leaving and then being in this non-traditional practice and realizing, oh crap, you know, like I spent years in architecture education and a lot of the, the things I learned in history and theory were not, it doesn't align with anything I do now. Um, and that actually does something really weird to your psyche as well and your confidence. And I see this with a lot of um, young women, especially um, like around my age or in education um, where you're, made to feel like your ideas maybe are not valuable or, um, you know, this kind of... I think there was a lot of men that we were taught to follow their kind of practices, follow their ideas, or they had ideologies, all these movements that we were taught about um, that we had to kind of adopt and learn from. And there were so many women missing from, from those stories and those narratives and you end up feeling like, am I just a terrible architect? Am I just not the, the right type of thinker for this practice? And then you, the unlearning comes in like, no, actually I'm okay and I belong here um, and I have residency here and my ideas are valuable. I just need to test them out. I just need to draw them. Um, so I think that's the kind of unlearning we need to do, especially because it's. I think it's caused... Um, a type of harm in our industry that we're still not come to terms with, um, just so that if we've been absent from these spaces and from these narratives for so long, it's, I mean, we already know this, but it's very possible that we have to look at reforming a lot of the way in which we design. So just like practice, like how the structure we have in practice, the structure we have in education, um, and quite physically the the maybe the dimensions and the, the aesthetics and, and I find what you, what you said about aesthetics really interesting because I'm someone that's constantly talking about how my speculative works is futuristic but because it's not the macho kind of very stereotypical idea of futurism people don't understand this, this, doesn't, this doesn't look like futurism it doesn't look like Star Wars it doesn't look like you know and <laughs> um, so um there's that, but also now I kind of advocate for what I do more and I advocate for people around me more. So it's kind of like a, it's um, it's on a very personal, emotional way that you have to kind of um, develop these, these practices. Um, yeah. So I think, I think it's, I think it's a, it's a weird one because we, we're coming to terms or starting to understand how much I'm learning we're having to do, but with architecture, it feels like a lot of the speculative work, a lot of these movements we learn about, they have a knock-on effect, and it takes years to kind of um, start to even fix. Yeah. Um, I, I think in my life, there's always been a sort of constant oscillation between the sense of um, trying to grasp what the knowledge I'm required to 
assimilate is, which I'd call the patriarchal ways of doing, and a way of thinking which I feel more comfortable with. And, okay, I don't know what you want to call it. We could call it a feminist way of thinking, but I think when I first started at architecture school, I, I probably wasn't a fully paid up feminist and didn't really know what it was, even though I'd been brought up by a feminist mother. So I couldn't name it, but I probably was it. And I still struggle with my identity and the kind of uh, recognition of my identity within the mainstream culture. It doesn't really go away. I think perhaps things shift a little bit towards you, or of course you are molded by it, so you can't really avoid that. But I think the really key thing is to try and retain that, your identity in the face of all this other noise, to constantly relearn and be open and curious to the things that you think are valuable, even if the mainstream doesn't find them valuable, that's very difficult, but you need to do it. And be and that curiosity must mean a kind of fearlessness and an ability to accept that you will be out of control and you will be isolated and you won't be understood. And you just have to go on and do it anyway, because if you don't, you're not going to grow and you're not going to develop. And so that does require a certain level of confidence, you know, or, you know, in the past, we'd have been called hysterical, you know, because we, we, because we're women, <laughs> I'm a woman, you know, and I don't behave in the same way that, you know, the mainstream patriarchal ways behaving are. But I think we have to hang on to a way of understanding the world, a way of knowing and a way of acting, which is not necessarily fully accepted. And that's how we're going to grow. We're going to grow the movement, we're going to grow the understanding, and we're going to communicate it to other people. It's really, really important. And, and I do, I think the younger generation, I mean, you know, I'm in the older generation now, but I think the younger generation, I detect a certain reluctance to, you know, go into the fearless category and step into the unknown and be out of control. And I get that, but I think you've got to feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah, permission to get things wrong as well. Mm. Sorry. Permission to get things wrong. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Totally, you're going to do it. Yeah. yeah. yeah to, to me, at least, uh, learning, um, when, when you said the first time on learning, we, we always talk a bit about it in the collective, but for me, it has been a process of being with, working with friends from uni and just um, talk about these spatial issues that, um, you know, sharing basically research with one another. And for me, not only like, I realized that we need to unlearn the way we have been grown up with, but also like, I think there's been a lot of unlearning between each other. And, um, and I think that's um, basically I completely understand the fearlessness of your own identity, but at the same time, I feel I need them as well to, like, to make me think about what I'm saying in a way, so it doesn't have to sound a bit dumb. But I, I think I, like, I enjoy the, the back and forth that comes from uh, challenging my own opinion on certain topics. And um, maybe as a person of identity, I'm someone that has always been very clear what is you know, black or white, or like, I don't know, I was always very clear in my childhood, and I think a bit like what, what you said, Sarah, about being out of control, this process of working with other people and trying to challenge the norms made me challenge also um, my own self with what I thought it was, um, was the right way to go forward. So um, it's a bit personal, but I guess, um, that's a learning from me, in a way. I'm, I'm interested in this, um, what you just said, Sarah, about the younger generation, sorry, be, being scared to get things wrong. 
Is that why do you think that is? Sorry, am I allowed to ask yeah, a question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, is, there is a massive fear of failure, you know, but I think, what do we mean by failure? You know, whose terms are we on? <coughs> whose values are we working with? I think, I think that is the thing that we have to think about. Um, I don't know, I mean, yeah, I, stepping outside of accepted structures and being, um, well, being able, being, being given the license to fail, I think it's becoming more difficult to do, actually. Mm -hmm. I think the, um, the censure you... that you get or the, you know, the penalties that you can have, but getting it wrong are quite extreme sometimes. But, um, yeah. I was just going to ask if you think it's linked. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> That's just my perception. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe know. increased like financial insecurity yes, for I this generation. Well. and yeah. it's The precarity. Of yeah, exactly. Yeah, increased precarity. Really. But, you know, I would say that even in our practice, you know, we've been going 30 years now, you know, yeah. it's still precarious. Yeah, you know, of course. Very precarious. It's amazing. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't get any better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> George, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, I um, maybe I'm just, yeah, I kind of want to see you too. Um, I guess uh, for me, it's like trying to escape this mindset of scarcity. Um, you know, accumulate more, do it bigger. Um, you know, grab as much as you can because if you don't, then you're gonna miss the opportunity um, and that actually to try and get to a space w or a place where um, you can see abundance in working with rather than working against. And I find it really exhausting because on a day-to-day -day basis, you have to remind yourself that you don't, you, you are not working against. <laughs> Um, or you shouldn't be working against, but uh, yeah. I mean, maybe I stop there. Um, I, I have like so many questions, so I'm a bit overwhelmed by how many questions I want to ask. But um, I also want to open it up to other people to ask questions. So, um, but maybe while you're thinking of them, um, <laughs> I'll ask one more question. Um, and just to pick up on the point you made about vulnerability, but I think everyone was talking about this as well, like the fearlessness that also is accompanied by vulnerability. But I think, um, I don't know, I guess beyond gender binaries, I think we often think that in unlearning, we have to have an alternative that we're proposing, um, or we have to have the answers. And actually, a lot of this, as you were saying, like, you're, you know, in practice, you're always figuring things out. Sometimes there's a lot of vulnerability, but also power that comes from not knowing the answers. And I think, Ran, when you were speaking about like how much there is to unlearn, like sometimes it feels really overwhelming, but I also think there's, it's really exciting to sometimes not know what's gonna come next. Or I like disagree with so much of the stuff that's happening right now, but I'm, I'm excited that there are so many possibilities of what could take its place. And I guess, um, I guess like because we exist in a place where there are all these frameworks we have to comply with and clients that don't understand, I was just curious how each of you deal with like how you shift, even if it's marginally like the value systems within which you want to operate, like how do you take it away from, um, I guess like you had a lot of uh, lists in your presentation, Sarah, of, of all these things that you were against and that you were trying to, uh, and other things that you were trying to push for. But I guess like, how do you, how does that almost become a conversation with the people you, you collaborate with or the, the frameworks you're forced to exist within to try and shift those? Um. Yeah, I think um, for us, it's been to, you know, the other kind of level of uh, unlearning has been to the extent of, thinking about what even the role of the designer or the architect would be. Um, and so there is an excitement because it feels like we have probably autonomy and power to redefine that, redefine the role. Um, and so, for example, recently I've been thinking the way we practice and the way we taught about what the role of the architect is, is so fundamentally wrong. Um, and I see that from how we practice now, which is very much less the um, this kind of uh, singular author 
doesn't exist as much and it's very much kind of translating communities and groups of people's designs into something that can be built technically. Um, and so there is so much excitement and, and it does require vulnerability and I think it requires also courage. Um, I think it requires the type of courage that, again, I on feminist practice, I think it's not just about like how we design and how we build, but how we treat people in practice. Because I think I realise now, not now, but much earlier on, that um, a lot of the ideas, kind of great ideas, were suppressed by probably the treatment that women got in practice. I think actually traditional, a lot of traditional architecture practice, I think, are very unsafe spaces for women, full stop. And so when you're when you feel unsafe, I, I, I can only imagine what this does to your design process. Um, I think the design process is something very much attached to your um, your sense of self, your confidence, courage. Um, and so I think this looks like being a feminist in practice looks like also advocating for yourself and others. Um, so one thing that I kind of, to be honest with you, have a lot of resentment for um, on you know in the traditional practices that I operated in was constantly advocating for others but not receiving mm. the same advocacy especially as a as a Arabic speaking black woman I mean I used to get my image my, the, my bio photo removed from profile bids all the time um, and make still make a lot of money for for these male-led um, architecture practices and so I think I think that's where education, I think architecture education misses the point where it's not, let's not just talk about aesthetics, let's not just talk about the paper and the pen and, and these lines, but let's talk about actually how you treat others in practice um, and and what kind of systems you would want in place. And and when are you, when do you feel like you're your best designer? You know, when do you feel most safe? Um, when do you feel best advocated for? Um when do you feel the most confident? And just trying to learn about what kind of environments best accommodate for good design and so that we can actually start implementing that because I really don't think it exists in traditional practice or traditional academia as someone who's still in traditional academia at all. Um, I mean, I still have, I come across units, I'm not going to name them, but um, units that... Um, I, I have a lot of distaste for because there's a lot of drawings, there's a lot of visuals, there's a lot of sometimes style, which I think is wrong um, on so many levels, but um, a removal of people and community. And that's one thing I forgot to mention earlier, which is I think feminist practice for us looks like constantly collaborating with others, constantly. Um, and not, you know, we, we're a very small practice, we're only two, two years old. Um, we don't have the capacity to hire teams, but we do have capacity to collaborate with new people. So as a two-year practice, we can say we've worked with maybe 10, 15 people so far. And that could be anything from working, you know, like with the other young creatives, someone like Avni for three months, um, which was lovely, and working with the young people. Um, so I think, yeah, I think, I think it's a shame as designers people who are supposed to be designers of space, not to have conversation about how the spaces should be accommodating for us. Um, hey, firstly, um, thanks so much for the presentations. It was really enjoyable. Um, I really enjoyed how the sense of identity and values is really permeates through all of your work um, and all of the projects that you discussed. Um, I guess looking at Sarah, your work and, and, and the drawings and the kind of the collapse of the personal and the, and the work environment, it kind of makes me think of kind of Sarah Ahmed when she talks about the feminist killjoy and the kind of work that surrounds kind of educating people and challenging people and, and, and feminist practice. And I just wondered from a kind of personal perspective, how do you navigate these kind of barriers between the self and, and, and work and how they kind of interact and, and how you kind of don't get lost um, in, in a lot of that anger and a lot of that frustration um, day to day. Thanks. Is that directed at me personally? You know, oh, the whole lot, okay. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. well, fess up 
I'm a bit of an obsessive compulsive. So if I get into something, I can really get into it. So I can completely focus on my work in the office. But equally, um, I can go back home and forget all about it. And in a way, that's one of the guiding principles about the problem of living and working on the same site, right? I don't really believe in the kind of enlightenment idea of the sort of workplace being very different. I mean, it's an industrial idea, isn't it? That, you know, we, we work somewhere and we live somewhere else. It's a sort of, sort of 18th century enlightenment idea brought about through capitalism, essentially. Well, we're in a service economy, and I think on the whole, you know, women's lives are not like that. And I, it just occurred to me, you know, while I was a young architect, that actually, while I was drawing, you know, I was thinking about what I was going to have for supper, or I needed to take the bin out, or go and ring my mum, or whatever it is. You know, you don't just block those things out. They, they're, they're moving around in your head all the time, and you're planning other things while, you know, in the, your, your brain's kind of in neutral, if you like. Let's put it that way. And I got really interested in how actually some breakthrough moments in my creative life happened while I wasn't at the drawing board <laughs> or the computer. They were while I was washing up, you know, or doing the gardening or some other form of sort of doubt, what we call downtime, you know. But actually, the breakthroughs happen in those moments somehow. You know, something clicks into place. And when you go back, into work, it's, it resolves itself in some fashion. So, you know, I'm a real believer in this kind of melding of the worlds that we occupy mentally, but also spatially. And I think spatial, um, you know, difference in those ways and doing different things and uh, being creative in different ways, you know, they're all part of it, the, the whole human being and the whole sort of making of the world the way you're, you're trying to make it. Um, so, you know, I think that's one of the motivations behind Stop Orchard Street is to try and bring those together. Obviously, it's happening more and more <coughs> through it, uh, being enabled through technology as well, because, you know, the laptop or the, the smartphone means that you can actually work anywhere now. And, you know, I'm always, always having this fight with Jeremy, now get off the sofa with your computer, because, you know, he's at the, at the computer all the time uh, so he might be watching telly or whatever but he might also be working and doing his emails and I think you know those are I mean we just accept now that living and working are completely combined and actually you know it does make you wonder about the sort of spatial separation that we've imposed I suppose I mean the one thing I do think about coming together in the same space when you're trying to make a practice is that it is important I think to be physically in the same world because actually you're creating a culture that way um, of kind of listening to each other and picking up on emotional nuance and and building the culture of your practice you know and um, you know coming back from COVID I, fa I found it quite difficult to rebuild that um, I think when you're really atomized and just really isolated, it's quite difficult to build a sense of identity, you know, whatever that is. Um, yeah, I completely want to echo what um, you were saying, Sarah, about the kind of artificial separation between life and work. Um, and I'm always kind of like picky about language because if you, I mean, we have to use metaphors and dichotomies for discussion purposes, but um, uh, if we set the dichotomy as life and work, that kind of assumes that life is pleasure or something. There's a lot of work in life. Um, and the other way around also, I suppose. Um, but I was quite um, interested in the, in the part of your question where you said, like, how do you not get lost in anger? Um, and I wanted to respond to that. So I think one thing is that anger can be very productive. It can be kind of a creative impulse. Um, and the other thing is um, be angry with others. It, it helps, I find. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah, I agree on, <laughs> on anger being productive because I think that's 
that's where, you know, I th- I'm just thinking back of the design process. I think like getting angry at something that doesn't work in a system or in a building or in a design or in even just like the, the mechanisms of a door helps you arrive at a resolution. Um, I also think that um, me personally, I think we should practice this kind of um, this advocacy through criticizing, <laughs> you know, like um, actually criticizing maybe old practices that we don't agree with, but even just new ones. Um, and I think the way that from from a personal level, the way that's manifested for us to space black is, you know, we were kind of very upset with how what our situations were in traditional practice. And we just, we didn't think that that was the way we wanted to practice. We also didn't want to remove ourselves completely as architects and engineers from the built environment industry. And that meant creating something new. Um, And so in that way, I think anger can sometimes, frustration be very productive. Um, And actually it's, you know, it's it's, it's so interesting because I've noticed recently that whenever I talk about anger to kind of cis men they think I'm talking about reactionary anger and not emotional anger I think it's like being angry is absolutely okay um and it should be invited but um I think that um I I think for a long time I felt angry with architecture and the modes of traditional practice and education and just the whole journey because I probably didn't advocate for myself uh, enough. Um, so I think, yeah, and now now that I do, it's like this, I, 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 may, I may seem very angry at times, but actually I'm like, that's great. <laughs> you know, I did, I said what I wanted to say and that was really good. Um, and then that means you can get on with doing what you want to do with like, actually with the level of tenacity and, and ownership. And so at Space Black, you know, whenever I talk to my students about what we do or whenever I'm kind of presenting what we do, um, when I talk about our venture of like culture, um, so having these events, you know, Hibbard, Hibbard's here at the back there, but she DJs as well and she'll DJ an event. We'll talk about architecture and then she'll DJ, you know, and then we'll dance to music. And that's a kind of like very informal um really I I think very beautiful spaces of where we end up talking about space architecture and advocacy for 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 all really in designing for communities and 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 their environments so I think I think yeah I think that's one way which is like flipping it and just like I'm gonna do my own thing I'm gonna do well I'm gonna have fun with it as well um so yeah um uh yeah I mean it's a difficult question Um, I think because I guess maybe a simple answer is to set some boundaries (laughs) Um, I think I I don't want to romanticize the kind of work all of the work that we do I think there's a big chunk of the work that we do um, which is maybe not uh, necessarily um, uh, not necessarily the the which maybe takes up a lot of space, but isn't necessarily the kind of work that we want to be focusing on. Um, and I feel like a lot of my time is I. And in those kind of uh, interactions, like I think ultimately, like you know, our labor is monetized, and and we talked about this actually a few weeks ago when we were in a panel together, Ration. Um, um, and uh, and we are part of a kind of a broader economic system of commerce, and um, uh, which very often is very extractive. And as much as I love some of the projects that we do, that and that are very much um, uh, are much more embodied, uh, there is still a big part of my day uh, that is spent doing things that we have to do to sustain a practice. Um, uh, and, you know, slowly we're doing less of that and more of the kind of work that we want to do. But um, but the only way that I, for me at least, uh, that I was able to navigate all of this is to set some boundaries and also to acknowledge that I'm not all about, like, work doesn't define, like, what I do as work is not what defines me and that there are, many versions of myself that I want to explore 
at different times and I should give them the space. Mm. And also actually I found that emptiness <laughs> um, is probably one of the most productive forms of space um, for me. So, yeah. Um, well, thanks everyone for the, for the talks. They were really amazing. And I wanted to ask you a question about technology. Um, it got uh, triggered by Sarah's presentation and the way you describe different sort of like elements of the how to describe as high tech and then lots of other material choices in a normative way perhaps would be described as, as low tech. So I wanted to ask the panel if you think there is a feminist attitude or a feminist way of engaging with technology. Sorry, I didn't quite hear the, the final question. Do I think... If there is a feminist attitude to engaging with technology, if you think there is such a thing or if, if such a thing can be defined. The tough one. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, Sorry. Yes, yes, of course. I mean, one of the things that I... Well, I think this is a really complex conversation because it does sort of touch on aesthetics and I don't... Um, I'm not really interested in being um, sort of definitive and um, sort of essentialist about aesthetics and sort of mapping aesthetic strategies onto gender. Uh, that doesn't interest me. But what I think is interesting uh, about what we were certainly what we were trying to do in Stock Orchard Street. I mean, we were, we were being provocative by kind of swapping, if you like, the, the again, the, the kind of material language of, you know, soft domesticity on the office as opposed to industrial processes that get stuck on the outside of the house. I think, but, you know, in a way that's kind of, yeah, get it, it's quite straightforward. And it's playing with the kind of archetypes that are accepted within architecture. I think what's more interesting is the fact that we put the straw on display. And so, and, and you could see through the polycarbonate. Um, and, you know, there's this kind of juxtaposition of what I'd call slick and hairy, you know, coming together. Mm -hmm. And the hairiness of the bales, which we just left as they were, you know, it's a bit like showing your pubic hair, you know. <laughs> It's rude in architectural terms. And, you know, okay, it's a bit like childish perhaps to do that. But at the same time, you know, you're having fun and you're sort of poking at the limits of what's kind of acceptable in terms of polite behavior in architecture. And I mean, it's not particularly feminist tactic. It's a kind of surrealist tactic, if you like, more, moreover. But, you know, I think it has kind of echoes of some strategies that feminists have used to sort of reveal the structures of patriarchy which are, um, you know, accepted without thought, mostly. And, you know, that's what's interesting to me. So in a way, we're behaving more like artists, you know, the freedom that you have to, as an artist sort of play with um, convention and, you know, it could have come out in any, in any way. But I mean, I think, you know, the reception of the building as being, you know, too tactile, too sensory, too many ideas, too much of this, too much of that, just too much, you know, um, it's sort of indicating that it's badly behaved, you know. I think all of these things have been applied to women in the past, you know. And so, you know, we were kind of like bad girls, you know. And I... I hey, you know, that's, that's why we did it. <laughs> that's the whole point. <laughs> well, I suppose we've, um, at Edit, we've engaged with uh, technology from a slightly different angle, um, thinking about domestic appliances and kind of like what makes them domestic and thus gendered. Um, and it's, um, I found it really quite, um, telling um, the kind of gendered echoes in those criticisms that you were talking about, Sarah, and um, when someone said um, the building looks like your granny's knickers, and I'm like, why is that an insult anyway? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's quite telling when I sometimes tell people I research drying laundry 
Um, and sometimes people laugh. Um, and I mean, I don't mind so much because I get that it's not the most obvious topic. Um, but why are some technologies seen as more serious than others? Um, I suppose. So I guess we've um, we've been trying to pick up on these gendered aspects of of different technologies, and you know, like buildings. It the way um, domestic appliances are uh, made and sold and marketed. It's connected to um, infrastructure, to plumbing, to layout of houses. So that's how we've been sort of like finding our trail of a feminist kind of questioning of technology. I guess just, uh, oh, I'm sorry. just a generic point, I think, is that, I don't know, I feel like a lot of us are, are more interested in what is the everyday and how to, to change the everyday, which is sometimes mostly low tech and whilst maybe other practices are looking for how, how to best make something if more efficient um, and more like high tech whilst not really questioning the kind of um, the basis of the actions in a way. So in a way to question the, the performance um, need to go to the the actual low tech um, action of being in space instead of trying to make something super efficient that it's in a way wrong in itself first. I don't know if it makes sense in a, in a generic way, but anyway, sorry, here you go. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, I'm going to try and make this really quick because it's getting late, but um, also, Sarah, I don't think it ever stops being thrilling when you say, I don't know what I'm doing. It, Sorry, second. I don't think it ever stops being thrilling when you say you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> and then to use the word pubic hair on the panel was just spot on. Thank you. Um, but, OK, I'm going to try and not make this utter crap. What I thought was interesting, and I'm going like right back to the beginning, was between George and Sarah, you were, talk you were talking about dismantling hang on, oppressive systems that we're trying to escape. There you go, right? Quoted you there. Um, and you were talking about like sort of transparency and structures within material cultures, right? I think. Yeah. Um, and then Sarah, you were sort of talking about how you don't know what you're doing and people want these hierarchies, but also you're trying to flat structure, which is kind of opposing and it's something that I've kind of grappled with because um, so I, I'm, a, I'm a practitioner at Muff Architecture Art and they would operate like a flat system but then when you want to go and join a framework they want to know who's at the top who's at the bottom who's getting paid what and and you know everyone needs to declare their gender and their race and it, it's all a bit suddenly it in one sense, because you were sort of saying, oh, sort of young people want all this structure, but then it also kind of destroys the flatness. And I sort of thought it was interesting because you were sort of saying about making the structure really clear, which is definitely a push of sort of the Gen Z in Muff is to have the structure and make it clear and who's in charge and what's my responsibility and what is not. But then it also rids that like collective and feminist energy of it's everybody's, it's everybody's energy. And I think it's different when you work in finance and your boss is taking home huge cuts of money. <laughs> but when it's not like that and it really is quite a flat structure and flat pay structure, I just, I just sort of thought it was interesting because you're, you're sort of playing around with the ideas that I'm really struggling with and how... And the more structure that's put in, like all the questions that G the GLA ask you are wonderful and it's making the pra our practices more diverse, but also, Jesus Christ, how long does it take to fill it all in? Like, and, and how much money is it costing practitioners to put in all that framework for a 12 person practice? I don't know, that's not really a question. I told you it was gonna be utter crap. I'm talking next week if anyone would like to hear more crap. <laughs> but seriously. <laughs> I don't know if you, any thoughts? Sorry. 
uh, like a really kind of product placement moment there. I loved it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and here's my book. You can buy it on Amazon. Um, um, I don't know. I I guess in a way for us it was uh, it was really something that. Um, in a way, like to establish a base that we're working with and to really find a way to, to start from something and then build on it and, and not necessarily, uh, it's not static. It's not something that, oh, you know, we, we drew, we drew up some policies and that's it. So we're good to go. It's more like, okay, let's define the terms of engagement here and then let's continue to revisit them. Um, as you know, as we're kind of growing as individuals, but also maybe as a practice, um, and also as we're testing some of these terms that we've set, you know, like does it work actually in this way? Um, is you know, core office hours working or is it not working? Like, who is it benefiting? Who is it not? Yeah, I think in a way it's for us at least like it feels necessary so that we can so there is a bit of clarity and there's a starting point um yeah question is so broad ranging it's really well it's not really a question is it it's a, it's a discourse I, I i don't know i i don't really know how to respond and i mean i think um you know, I find myself in a position where I sort of regret that I don't have a circle perhaps around me like you do of other collaborators that I've, I've found myself as a lone leader. That's, and that sort of saddens me in a way because I love collaboration and I think that's Perhaps I've got this fiction in my mind that we do have a flat hierarchy, but actually we don't. <laughs> uh, that I have to wear the mantle of the leader and people look to me for leadership because of that. And also there's a massive age difference because mostly people that I work with are half my age, you know, and, and that's, a, that's a difference in experience, outlook, you know, upbringing and all of the other things because I've just lived longer and I was brought up in a different era you know, with different concerns and all the rest of it. So um, I kind of regret that. You know, I, I love collaborating with people, but I, I kind of find myself in that position. But, you know, and, and at many, in many ways, our practice is very conventional because we have all the structures. You know, we have the, um, the salary charts, you know, and uh, the health and safety file, and, <laughs> you know, um, all of that stuff that, really underpins a kind of structure to make the thing work and but at the same time I do kind of resist that because I you know it just seems to it goes back to the earlier conversation about um, fluidity and reinvention because actually all of that seems to be the dead weight that pins us down whereas what we want to do is fly and be and really self-define in very different ways and 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 I think that sort of schizophrenic um you know, duality that you're kind of constantly oscillating through. I don't navigate very easily. You know, I, I sort of feel it ties me down. I don't want it really, but we have to have it because of the way, the kind of environment we operate in. You know, it's an expectation of it. Um, and that's. So you take it really seriously. Like, we do take it seriously. Your yeah. Are really, really good. Um, I just think it's interesting because it's like it binds you to something, but. It, it's progressive, but it's binding. It's, it's obviously it's changing all the time, and it's in response to all sorts of things, you know, external conditions and so forth. And I think the thing that we've struggled most with recently, which is such a disappointment, is with fees being driven low, lower and lower, and more and more competitive in the public sector. You know, and honouring flexible working with people coming and going at all different times and trying to pay living wages, good wages for people, um, it just is not working. It is so difficult at the moment, you know. And I would so want to support that in the practice, but it's, it's we can't do it, you know. Um, 
and the people who underbid us all the time or the people who don't pay interns, you know, just buy into the system in a way that we're not prepared to do. And so we will fail, you know. I th hopefully Within not. those terms, you know, we can't operate. Hopefully not, but I think there's obviously so much to talk about and I hope we will keep talking about it, but I'm conscious of time. But we will have some drinks in the room over there and hopefully we can keep talking about all these things. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. It's been really lovely to have you. Um, I, if you would like to come to the next event in the series, it is on Tuesday and Sarah will be speaking there. I promise I was going to plug it. It's in my notes. You can check. But you should all come. It's called Making Visible and it's about how uh, people can and are making all of this amazing work uh, more visible through podcasts, photography um, and the work of Part W. So please do join us and uh, please join me in thanking our amazing speakers again. Thank you.